Today we're going to talk about the Christmas seed, and we're going to talk about the very first announcement of the birth of Christ in the Bible, this is the announcement of a promise and the promise of a child. It's Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He'll bruise your head and you'll bruise his heel. This is God talking to the serpent for the deception that he brought to Adam and Eve and into the garden, and he makes a promise that there's going to be a seed. I'll call it just for kicks, the Christmas seed, since we're in the Christmas season. The birth of Jesus was a seed. It was a promise that would bring destruction and death to the enemy. The problem is a lot of you are continuously getting your heel struck and you're walking like cro crooked Christians. Yeah, that's where we're going to go today. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get right to the point. This understanding of seed is more than just a, a plant seed that you put in the ground, but it's symbolic of offspring and descendants. There was one main seed, his name's Jesus Christ, and then he's the word and the word are seeds, but then we also become the father's seeds or offsprings. The devil's already defeated, but he's still alive and active. So even though he's under your feet, he must continuously be crushed on a daily basis. The devil doesn't have a part-time job. He has a full-time job, and he's always coming against you to accuse you, lie to you, deceive you, bring fear, worry, doubt, and disbelief, addiction, spinning out, anger, rage, hatred, and the list goes on. But when you give your life to Christ, you become the Father's seed, and that seed has power. We're seeds with power to crush the head of the enemy. We're the Father's offspring. Let's say that together. I am the Father's offspring, which means your sons and daughters. And sons and daughters have authority and power. Sons and daughters take on his nature, his character, his identity, his spirit, and his power. A true son has full power and full access to everything that God provides. So if you're walking less than, it's not his fault. It's just that you don't know it yet, or you've chosen to not discover it. Let me have another sip of my coffee here. This, this is getting good right now. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Your heel may get bruised, but his head gets crushed. You just leave that scripture up there. We're going we're to camp on this for a while today. He's always striking. But because he's been defeated and he's under our feet, he really only has one place to hit, and that's your heel. But we have to understand the importance of the heel. When your heel's bruised, it affects your ability to walk properly. I don't know, somewhere around 10 million people have heel spurs or plantar fasciitis. If you've ever had it, it's painful. It's a chronic inflammation of this thick band of tissue between your heel and your toes. Once that inflammation kicks in, if it does not get comforted, healed, if you don't deal with the issue, that inflammation over long periods of time causes calcification. <clears throat> and calcification is what turns into heel spurs. Calcification, in turn, over long periods of time, causes an extreme hardening, discomfort, numbness, tingling, radiating pain, and nearly an ability to do much of anything because you can't walk, exercise. You're in constant pain when you wake up in the morning. It's extremely difficult. Speaking spiritually, the devil's under your feet and the best he can do is strike your heel, but he wants to affect your walk and cause you to walk crooked because when your heel's hurting, you walk crooked. It's hard to walk straight when you have a damaged and injured heel. Or sometimes you just can't walk at all and you just stop walking because your heel hurts so bad. The devil 
injures your heel through constant temptation, lies, deceit, fear, accusation, complaining. He's always striking. You have to understand this. The devil never stops striking. The key is we have to stop getting snake bit. And a lot of us in this room, some of you watching online, a lot of people we know are snake bit. They've stopped walking. They got calcification in their heel, which has led to calcification in your heart, which then in turn makes your heart hard. But God has a remedy for a hard heart. He has a remedy. The enemy's strike is the lie of sin and, pre- and the presentation of the fruit of the tree of death. So he's always presenting to you this, we'll just call it an apple. It wasn't, I don't think it was an apple, but the, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and death, death is always being dangled. And it falls into three categories, the pride of sin, the pride of life, and the lust of flesh, lust of the flesh. Always be wiser, smarter, gain more knowledge, lack of love, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies, so we're always learning, never perceiving, right? And then we're always allowing our eyes to rule and lead us instead of faith. That's why you walk by faith and not by sight. Because what you see, if you're not looking at Christ accurately and properly, then these dangled deceptions of the tree and the lies are always in front of you and he's always trying to bait you. So we're all always being baited by the enemy. The key is don't take the bait. So he's always striking. Even though he's been defeated and he's under your feet, he always is striking your heel because he wants you to become a crooked Christian. Our deception comes when we take the bait. Don't take the bait. Don't take the bait. And especially, it gets worse if you do take the bait, but then you don't repent. See, the Lord knows that there'll be shortcomings and inadequacies, and sometimes you're going to sin. Though a righteous man falls seven times, you get back up again, you dust yourself off, and actually you crush the devil's head even more when you grab onto the mercy and the grace and the blood of Jesus and the repentance. So this is how it works. It's not in your own strength. Your gun and your power cannot crush Satan's head. But his power and you as his gun can. This is why you have to repent. This is why you gotta grab onto forgiveness. This is why you can't walk in shame. The freer you become the more his head is crushed. Injured heels leads to injured hearts. Hear what I'm saying to you. When I'm constantly being struck in my heel and if I don't deal with the snake bite, it becomes infectious and it goes right to your heart. And then in turn, your heart over a long period of time gets calcified. Calcified hearts need a spiritual heart transplant which is what we get from Ezekiel 36, 26, which says that God would literally cut out the heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. So the good news today is if you have calloused, hurt, wounded, jaded, listen, when you get hurt over and over and over and over again, especially by people you love, if you don't walk in massive amounts of forgiveness, it doesn't make it okay what they did. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is is if you don't find forgiveness, you'll find bitterness in its place, and bitterness is a root that springs up and defiles many. Bitterness always defiles. So we have to deal with these calcified heart issues, which means you must be born again. Don't even, don't even take a chance. When I ask somebody if they're born again, they're like, well, I'm not sure, then a lot of times that's revealing. Let's just be sure. Yeah. To be born again means that you surrender your life, you make the exchange, it's his life for your life, your life for his life, and it means that you're no longer living for yourself. It means, Lord, I want a new start, a fresh start. Hit the reset button, folks. Some of us have burned bridges down through addiction, pain, mass, countless marriages, and you feel like you can never get it right, and the truth is you can't in your own strength. But you must repent and surrender your life to Christ. 
Heel spurs need comfort and rest. Sometimes they need a brace, but most of the time they need a new pair of shoes. You need to get a new pair of shoes. My buddy Lee Adams called me about two weeks ago. He said, I see you get a new pair of shoes. He didn't know I'd ordered myself a custom new pair of Vans, white and black. I wore them last week. And then in the back, I had embroidered Rock City because I'm all in with our church. And he didn't know I had ordered a new pair of shoes. I've had dreams of new pair of shoes. I have, if you ever see me wear the brightest yellow pair of A6 Tiger shoes, I had a dream of walking in the night in, in like boxer shorts through the streets. All the lights were out except for one store in bright yellow, and it said, pay less shoe store. And I walked in, and the, the, the salesman says, this is the pair of shoes we have for you. The next day, I went online and bought those shoes. See, when you come to Christ, not only do you get a new heart, but you get a new pair of shoes, so you don't have to keep getting heel spurs because heel spurs and plantar fasciitis are often caused with an improper pair of shoes and not walking right. Isn't that so good? Are you guys tracking with me this morning? This is a good word. This is a great Christmas message. So many of us have been snake bit. Sometimes intentionally, we just stepped right into the viper's den, sometimes unintentionally. For some of us intentionally, we swung the door wide open. You're like, oh, I fell into sin, Pastor. I'm like, dude, you didn't fall. You knew exactly what you were doing. You did a triple backflip swan dive 10 with no splash in the pool. (laughs) I fell, Pastor, yeah. You knew right where you're going. Remember, the heart's deceitfully wicked. Sin always starts with a root in the heart when the desires take root and then they're manifested. But there are times that somehow you're just walking along through the field and you stepped right into the wood pile because snakes are deceptive and snakes hide and snakes don't want to be discovered. So they lurk in the shadows. And there are times that you unintentionally get snake bit. The key is when the enemy comes against you full full speed ahead and it seems like all the world around you is crashing and it seems like you're in a world of spiritual warfare, get your eyes on Jesus and hang on to him because God will always see you through. Learn to worship and pray and trust God and stop believing the lies that something's wrong with you. Repent. Listen, shame always tells you something's wrong with you. And that's the number one lie of the devil. There's nothing wrong with you. God loves you and he made you in his image. Now you gotta get back to his likeness because we lose the likeness until we get born again. And then when you get born again, you step back into your image and now you are like him. For some of us, we knew better believers than stepping into this wood pile. But for others that are not born again and don't know Christ, they had no clue. And they don't even realize that they're being snake bit. So why would you be so angry at them while the snake's biting on them? Instead, raise up Christ, show them Christ on the cross like the bronze snake raised up on the pole in the desert because all those Israelites getting snake bit deserved it. They were complainers. They were constantly frustrated, upset, dishonoring. And yet Jesus said, when I'm lifted up, all people have to do is look to me and their lives will be transformed. We have to lift up Christ for all to see. Either way, if you don't heal the snake bite, death ensues and we find ourselves walking crooked all the days of our life. Bruised heels always lead to crooked walks. To be crooked means you're dishonest, you're illegal, you're unpleasant, and you're unsatisfactory. Sadly, we have a world full of crooked Christians that have fallen to the lies and deception that come from bruised and calcified heels. And until you get the healing you need, how can you expect to bring healing to others that are walking crooked and broken? They desperately need you and me and a body of Christ to show them health and healing. God heals you to heal others. How does Satan's head get crushed? Or how did, it, how did it already get crushed? And how do we keep it crushed? Well, first, 
one of the f- number one ways that Satan's head was crushed was through the birth of Christ, which is what we are celebrating this month. I get asked all the time, Pastor, what do you think about Christmas? I get asked this all the time. I'm like, well, let me ask you a question. Do you have a Christmas tree in your house? They're like, yes, sir. I said, do you and your family bow down and worship the Christmas tree? They're like, no, we don't. I said, is that Christmas tree an idol in your life? Nope. Is, are, is, the, is the spirit of this age of buying gifts all consuming and are you spending money you don't have and are, is it all about presents or is it all about Christ? They're like, they have to pause on that one thing about that. It's like, and then they say, you know, we want it to be all about Christ. Then you're okay. Because the ornaments on the evergreen in the Old Testament was idolatry and people were worshiping it. How is it idolatry today? when you're not really making it about, about Christ and it's all about the gifts and presence and Jesus's voice and the celebration of Christ is minimal and small. That is the idolatry of the spirit of the sage. Can I get an amen? amen. There you go. There's your Christmas mess. I just answered your question for you. For, I have lots of friends that don't celebrate Christmas. They don't, want, want, they don't do Christmas trees. I'm totally fine with that. But I also have no issue. We have a Christmas tree. We've got a couple on the stage. There's one in the lobby and nobody's worshiping the Christmas tree. We're celebrating Christ the King, but you better, not, you better not buy into the idolatry of the spirit of this age and make it all about presents and gifts and Christ's heard, voice is heard small. Every day for Advent, we read a book about Christ or, or who Saint Nicholas really was and what he did and what the spirit behind it is. And we pray and we read Bible stories and my kids did angel tree and I took them to the store and they spent their own money that they worked for to buy gifts for kids who have parents incarcerated in prison. There is zero idolatry in my heart and in my family related to Christmas. And if there isn't yours, just repent and get it out or get rid of your Christmas treats, one or the other. (laughs) And I'm sure y'all ain't getting rid of the Christmas tree. So deal with your heart issue. So the birth of Christ was a crushing blow to Satan's kingdom of darkness. You have to understand that the devil hated the fact that Jesus was born. That's why Satan moved Herod's heart to kill all the firstborn children. Let's look at Matthew 2, 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth to put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. This is known as the massacre of the innocents. This was actually prophesied, and you can study it out on Wikipedia or online. The point is, is that if, the, if Herod was, was so angry at the deception that he chose to kill all the children two years and under, who was pulling on his heart to do it? Satan was. Because Satan knew the power of the seed. He knew the power of the seed. And if he didn't move quick and move with all his might, then he knew his head was going to be crushed mightily. The next way that Satan's head was crushed really... The, the ultimate blow to his head was this understanding of the cross and the resurrection. So Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was the ultimate and final crush to Satan's head. So he's already got a busted up head. His head's already busted up. Don't kid yourself. He's, he's seriously on his last leg. In fact, I want to do a message about the fact that the devil is filled with wrath and fury to destroy the elect because he knows his time is short. So he already knows he's on short time, but we're living our lives like we're on long time. And you have no aggressiveness, no understanding. You're getting your world blown up and the devil's playing us like masters of puppets. And all we do is sit to the side and worry about our money and our jobs and our stuff and our flesh and how we feel good. We're drinking and smoking and you're acting like the world and you're supposed to be a Christian. Stop it. This is, there's no demilitarized zone in this day. If you want a lukewarm house, go somewhere else. This is an on fire church and you are expected to be on fire. And if you come here week in and week out, your sons and daughters of the kingdom and your members of this house, flame on and pay the price. You can do it. I got mercy, I got grace, but I'm also challenging you. I love you. If you don't know that I love you after all these years, then we got a problem. I love you, but I'm saying to you, buckle up, step up and let's roll. 
You cannot stay the same. And my word for next year is he's not leaving you the same. We can prophesy about all the new things we're gonna do, our new sanctuary, but really he's coming after you. He's gonna prune stuff out of your life and he wants to change you. So your prayer should be change me, God. The prayer should be change me, God. Then we have us as his body and the offspring of the father. You're an offspring. We're the many seeds at work in the earth to destroy the works of darkness. So Jesus is the ultimate seed, and then we become seeds of the Father through Christ. So now, as his body, the seed's in you. Say this with me. Say, I am a seed, seed. full of power power. to crush Satan's head. head. And even though all of us have been snake bit in our heels at one point or another, It's our healing through Christ that crushes Satan. It's my repentance, it's the forgiveness, it's the identity, it's the growth in who I am that crushes him along the way. Listen, I'm not a demon hunter and I'm not all about chasing after demons. I've been down that road and I almost died and I did spiritual warfare inaccurately. The the best spiritual warfare is to shut the door and worship the king, let the king do the rest. And you can't crush Satan's head when you have no peace because it's the God of peace that crushes Satan's head. You find peace and rest. Now, is it interesting? He bites your heel, but you crush his head. Let's talk about the head for a moment. My head used to be controlled by the devil's head. Tripping acid, mushrooms, sleeping around. Everything was for my own selfish gain money and selfish pleasures and selfish ambition. I even had a lot of that as a Christian, not even knowing because God had to work it out of me over time. But if you're gonna crush his head, you've got to understand this is the, the, the primary focus of the thoughts inside your head crushing the thoughts from his head. And now through the saving power of Christ, you have the mind of Christ. Let's say I have the mind of Christ. Say, devil, get out of my head. Your head's not my head. I'm under the headship of Christ. You have the mind of Christ now. And in the mind of Christ, fear, worry, anxiety, depression. Listen, I already know in this sanctuary today, there's a lot of people battling depression, anxiety, fear, some suicide. It's that time of the month or the year, I should say, that time of the year where people are combusting (laughs) and the devil's a liar. I have a, you have a new head. Say, I have a new head. Amen. Now you think, live, act, and walk differently. You're not a crooked Christian. If you're full of rage and anger and you're cussing like a sailor all the time and got sneaky hidden sin, you're being snake bit. And I'm telling you right now, it's going to calcify your heart. And we got some hard hearts in this sanctuary today. Angry, mad, hurting, broken, addicted, lonely, isolated. But see, God, I just showed it to you. He wants to make the exchange. He wants to give you a soft heart. What's a heart of flesh? It's pliable, moldable, tender, sensitive. I once walked crooked. Now I walk straight with peace, rest, and comfort. We got to get the devil out of our heads. He's never going to stop. He's always knocking, always striking, but you should always be crushing. Crush it. We should call this message crushing it. Let's heal your soul. So let's heal your heel. Let's heal your heel so you can crush the lies, deception, and oppression that's plagued you for so long. Look, you do not have to own ADD. You just need to drink more coffee. (laughs) Write that down, Jeremy. (laughs) Write that down. I had a Christian friend give me a uh, Xanax many years ago. I loved, man, I was just on top of the world, talking more than I ever talked. I went to my doctor. I said, hey, I need some of this stuff. He says, tell me about your past. (laughs) 
I said, do we really have to go there? He said, there's no way I'm prescribing you Xanax. He said, your job doesn't sound much different than mine. You're dealing with people dying all day long and counseling people that are dying. And he said, one of the best things for ADD for people like you and me is caffeine. Now, this is not a sales pitch for my coffee shop, but I am saying to you, there's, God knew I needed some coffee shops. How about that? We'll leave it at that. The next thing is you have to hate the devil and hate sin. Listen to this poem I'll make to you. You must hate the devil and hate sin. There's nothing else that you're to hate but the devil and sin. And, and you must be hostile to the kingdom of darkness. Let's go back to Genesis 3.15. This word enmity is important because this word literally means hostility and hatred. And it means that you will be treated as an enemy and you must treat the enemy as an enemy. It's, it's reciprocal. He hates you, you hate him. Got it? It's the war between seeds. You're a seed, he's, he has produced seeds. And he always wants to plant seeds of lies and deception, but you're a son or a daughter, and now there's this hatred between, which really the ultimate hatred isn't against you, it's against Christ. He hates God's plan for humanity. He hated it from day one. And he still hates you, because he really hates him. The devil has enmity towards you and you should have it towards him. What happens, I'm gonna ask you guys a question. I want you to think about something for a moment. What happens when you don't hate sin and hate the devil? When you don't hate sin and hate the devil, you will love sin and hate your brother. Because any sin ultimately is hatred towards yourself and someone else. Sin is never personal and private. It's always infectious. And you rob and steal and kill when you do things with others that are against God's design because we've lost a hatred towards sin and the devil. I hate him. And the best way for me to keep him under my feet is to worship Jesus and be a son and to keep the door shut. And if I crack it open at times, or I fall short, which you will, I quickly close it through repentance and forgiveness and confession. He may peek his head in the door, but I'm gonna catch his fingers and his nose when I shut it. Any sin with someone else is hatred towards them. Premarital sex, hatred towards your partner. You don't see it as hatred, but that's what God calls it because you're literally trespassing. Now we're to restore people that trespass, so we love you. There's restoration here. But if you shack up, you crack up. Now God is, you know what, let me just tell, I'm gonna say something about this church. We've had a lot of cracked up, shacking up people in this church. But then they got their life right, shut the door and got married, and now they're healthy sons and daughters because God is a merciful king. You shut the door and you did it right. Let's give them a hand clap that did it right. Right over here, right here, I can, right here. I'll just start calling y'all out. I mean, y'all are everywhere in this sanctuary. Listen, the only way for this to change is for you to change. We have to have a greater hatred towards the enemy, but some of us have greater hatred. Think about this. How much hatred and division is in this world towards one another? Would, any, would, would you all agree there's a lot? Yeah. And it seems like it's increasing, right? Yeah. People have a greater hatred towards another person than they do the devil and sin. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Am I right? Yeah. So that has to change, but the only way it can change is for you to change. You have to be the change. Let's say that. I have to be the change. That's right. And the only thing that can change you is Christ being birthed in you every day. You guys, we should all have this scripture memorized, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Know it, know it, know it, know it, know it. If you're in Christ, you have been, you are, and you will be always made new. 
So every day is a new day. Every morning is a new morning. Every night is a new night. Every moment is a new moment. So you're never stuck the same because God's made a promise of newness. So in my most difficult hour, when I feel stuck and it seems like nothing's changing for years, whether that's health or circumstances, if you're in that spot, you have to understand God made a promise to you that newness is coming because if you really gave your life to Christ a minute, then new, 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 new. It's new, new, new all the time. So the Nancy that I knew this morning will not be the Nancy that I'll know tomorrow. And the same in Jarrah will be made new consistently. Chris and Angie and Jeff and everybody in this sanctuary watching online, you have a promise that God says, I'll make all things new. So when it looks the same repetitively and you seem stuck and can't get out, God says, I'm gonna make it new. Only Christ can change the situation in your heart. Only Christ can bring internal change. Next, you have to have an understanding of perfect love and how the Father sees and treats us, so in turn, we can have perfect love in the way we see and treat other people. Perfect love is the crushing hammer of them all. And then throw some forgiveness in there and then throw some mercy and grace. Picture a giant ax, and written all over the ax head is mercy, grace, perfect love, truth, life, the blood of Jesus. And I'm swinging a spiritual ax. And the word of God, the word of God is the sword of the spirit. You got no weapon without the word of God. If the Holy Spirit's in you and his sword is the word, you must get rooted and grounded in the word so you know what to say, how to say, when to say. When I've cast many demons out of many people, and when I was casting out a demon out of that stripper girl, I've told the story many times. I was not at the strip club, by the way, (laughs) though that would have been a fun story. If it went that way, that would have been fun to tell. But I'm casting the demon out of the girl and I felt so much power that I just started using my own words and then the demon just got madder and nothing happened and hurting the girl and wriggling and writhing and foaming and all the stuff at the mouth. And it's like, I felt so much power that I got out of the word and I started to use my own words. So nothing was happening. The Lord said, stop, pull back, lift your hands up and worship. When I raised my hands, it was like sticking my fingers in a light socket, a 220 socket. Forget a light socket. It was 50 amps, right? through my body, 240 volts. And and I went back and I quoted the word of God and then the devil had to go. No one bypasses this process. I will fade away, it'll be a slow fade and I will forget the word and who I am because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the fastest way to forget is to stop hearing and then your faith goes away. Through grace, mercy, faith, authority, and power, and on my identity, your identity, the enemy remains crushed and has no place in your life. And then we go do that same thing for others. It brings greater crushing to the kingdom of darkness. When you make it your desire and ambition and passion to fulfill the great commission to go and make the sacrifice and and make disciples of all nations, you have a mandate from God, every one of us. This is not... Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. It's all of us yes. are supposed to go. The ultimate crush to the enemy's kingdom is pulling people out of darkness. Those haunted hotels that some of y'all like to go to. <laughs> that one in San Antonio. I hope I see a ghost. And listen, I loved poltergeist when I was a kid. But all y'all paranormal junkies, it's all demonic. And let me explain something to you. How does a a principality rule a region? How are you going to drive back darkness in a region? You're going to save men. Because demons want to inhabit men, not places. And trust me, that ghost at that hotel is inhabiting somebody. He just came out for a visit when you showed up. You want, to, you want to see true transformation? Save the hearts of people because once you get Christ in somebody, then the devil has no home. Then he has no city and region and place to be. Yes. Rescuing people from his grip and storming the gates of hell to pull people out is our call. 
But crooked people don't do that because crooked people are solely focused on themselves. But healthy, healed people do. And I understand that many of you are in the process right now of getting healthy and strong. But some of y'all have been a Christian for a long time. You've been coming to church for a long time and you're doing little to nothing with your faith but being a nice Christian. And I love you. But your coworkers, your friends, be a bright light. You don't even have to look. When you get in position and your eyes are on Christ, he'll set up the divine appointments. Remember, he already made the garden and then he put man in it. So you're already surrounded by a garden, but if you can't be trusted, you won't see it's a garden because you'll actually do more damage. But when your eyes are open, you'll see everybody as a seed and as a plant and as a promise from God. And then you realize that your job's to tend and keep and care for the garden. Your workplace is a garden. Many times that's why your boss is manifesting and treating you worse and you hate where you work and you complain, 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 complain. And if that's you, repent, 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 repent. Everyone's a seed full of incredible potential. Some people are dormant seeds, planted seeds and waiting, sprouted seeds, just coming up out of the ground. And some people are mighty trees. Some people can be death seeds because they have the seed of death in them and they're perishing and they're not repenting. So they're corrupted seeds that are bringing corruption to other people's lives. But even they can be saved because I've seen the worst of the worst of the worst, worst seemingly seeds of death get born again. In the Bible, the apostle Paul is one of them. A murderer wrote 13 books of the Bible. So you never give up on anybody and you don't predetermine this is a demonic bad seed. I'm gonna write you off. And you know what God will do when you say that? He'll bring you a lot more of those people. Do not say that. The key is for you to sow proper seeds and to trust the process the Father has in place for their healing and restoration. Be a seed sower, which means you have to be a seed gatherer, which means your heart's like this big giant bag of seeds. It's a treasure chest. I'm gonna say this again. Not one of us bypasses this process. No celebrity, no pastor, no wealthy person. No one bypasses the process of being a learned student of the word, sitting at his feet, abiding in the secret place and resting under his shadow. I would not talk the way that I talk or have authority that I have or be at, walk in confident identity and be rescuing people and pulling them out of darkness if I did not do it. And I'm no different than you. I don't get any extra special grace out of it. You've been given power and authority. Take it. Take it. Um, it, God's holding out. Now, some of y'all aren't gun people, but let's just roll with it. If I, I got two of my great friends right here in the front row. If I handed either of y'all an AR-15 and I said, here, it's yours. I know them, they wouldn't go, ah, oh, no, man. You don't need to give me a gun. They'd be like, hand that gun over. <laughs> God's handed you spiritual power and authority. You need to learn to grab it. You're not a doormat. The devil's under your feet. You're not defeated. You're a head, you're a tail. He's defeated. So he's a master of puppets and he's a liar and a deceiver, always seeking to keep you believing that you're less than with no power. You're not walking your identity. Did God, he's always putting a question mark where God's put a period. He always wants you to question who you are and who he is. In Luke chapter nine, verse one, some of y'all might say, well, I'm just a young Christian. Well, this was a written to young Christians and he said, he called his 12 disciples together and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. So he gave them power and authority to bring healing and life and deliverance to other people. Once you give your life to Christ, you have that, but you have to discover it, right? So I, I took my nine-year-old hunting. We taught him how to shoot, Bill Blodgett taught him how to shoot a 308 rifle so he could deer hunt. Same with my daughter. And then we shot a pistol, but I had to hold the pistol. He had to stand there, teach them, coach them every step of the way along the way. We don't just hand them the gun and say, have fun, son. You're nine and blow his head off. And many people are more demon happy than they are Jesus happy. And we, want, we like to follow all these deliverance ministers and they're not building family and community. You have to understand deliverance is a whole pie. 
and there's lots of slices. One slice is called bitterness. Let's get that out. One slice is called ungodly beliefs and lies. Let's get that one out. One's called spirit soul hurts. You got so much rejection in your soul and abuse in your soul. We gotta get this out of your soul through forgiveness and healing. And then the other one's called demonic oppression. And then the other one's called generational consequences. My daddy was an alcoholic and abuser and a liar. I'm an alcoholic abuser and a liar. And we pick all these things up along the way from things we've seen from our own family line. Pass right down. He was, he was hardcore militant and abusive. Most sons grow up to be dads just like that. So God gives you power. The devil's been defeated. In Luke 10, 17 through 20, he called another 70. And they went out and they did the same thing and they came back and they were so excited because the demons were subject to his name. Not your name, his name. And then he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And behold, I'm giving you this authority to trample. Notice the word trample, under your heel. Okay, scorpions is skeptics and serpents are critical, judgmental, high lighting vi vipers. And over all the power of the enemy, then nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, don't rejoice in it that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So the greater thing we should be really excited about is not the power I have over the enemy and casting out demons, though that can be fun and it's enjoyable to see the, the finger of God revealed when somebody gets deliver, delivered. The greater thing is, is that they give their life to Christ. And I've had many encounters with demonically possessed people. The demon manifests, but the person themselves did not wanna give their life to Christ. And so casting the demon out would do worse, worse damage to their soul because they weren't ready to surrender their life. Listen, surrender your life and God will give you the strength and the power to deal with the demons. Yes. Live a surrendered life every day. Mark 16, 7 through 18, through 18. These signs follow you. They should be literally following you around as you follow him. As you follow him, they follow you. Follow him, they'll follow you. And notice this, at the top of the list, you cast out demons. You cast them first out of your head and your heart. And then it goes on to laying hands on sick, praying in tongues, shikara basare, praying for people because your desires to stretch your hand out because you're following him. And he says, stretch your hand out and pray for that person. Colossians 2.15, principalities have been disarmed. Everybody say disarmed. So if you're dealing with an enemy whose weapon has been taken away, why do you keep giving him back his gun? <laughs> you think about that for a minute. You disarm, somebody shows up at your house, it's gonna be a home invasion, and somehow, some way, you're able to disarm them. They're down on the ground, you got him pinned down waiting for law enforcement to come. And you say, you know what, dude? I know. Just get back up. Here's, here's your gun back. And that's what we do with the enemy. And yes, sometimes we open the door and sometimes we hand him his gun back. But you got to learn to repent and walk in the goodness and the mercy and the grace and forgive yourself and stop living in the past and keep the door shut. Principalities and powers have been made a public spectacle and have been triumphed over. I'm gonna conclude this message with this saying we say a lot and I'm gonna, I'm gonna define what it means. If you're not fighting, you've already been captured. What does that mean? This means that you're trading the enemy's head for the headship of Christ in your life every day. It's not a one-time event, it's an all-the-time event. I did it then, I do it now, I'll do it tonight, I'll do it tomorrow. I did it this morning and every day, no matter what I face, hardship, springs pop and manifest in toilets, people calling in, kids screaming, fighting, lying, whatever it is that they're doing every day, no matter how hard it is, sickness, hardship, difficulties, people combusting, the worst news of the worst news. Every day my eyes are on Christ and I trade the lies and the deception of the enemy and the fear and worry and I grab onto a promise and I stay the course no matter what because you have a new head in your head. That's the mind of Christ. And you need to know what that means. It takes study, learn, grow, sit at his feet. It means you're keeping the door shut and you're hate, hating sin and hating the devil. 
It means you're fighting right. Fighting right means you're on your knees in the secret place continuously and that you're abiding, 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 abiding. He's the vine, you're the branches. Apart from you, you do nothing. Abide, 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 abide. And more than what you're gonna do and all the prophecy and the power and history makers and turning the world upside down, what you should be more excited about is that he saved your life and he loves you. It's not about what you're gonna do, it's about who you are. And only out of who you are will you do what you're gonna do properly. You have to learn to be spirit-led. Listen, learn to be spirit-led. This takes time, practicing his presence. You don't just overnight know. It's learning to discern. It's growing into maturity. It's getting off the milk bottle. Now read the word faithfully. Learn. There's so many Bible tools out there to help you. You can listen to it. You can watch it drawn out through the Read Scripture app. People explain it to you. There's no lack of teaching and knowledge. But in the, at the end of the day, at some point, you have to stop reading everybody else's book and read his book. <laughs> Worship no matter what. I mean, I, I, I will just say, I can't ever fathom a time that somebody should not be worshiping. Even if both your arms are broken and your mouth is taped shut, you can worship. I worship, oh man, I did a whole series on worship. I can't express to you enough how important it is that you worship even before your situation, before your breakthrough. What are, you, are you going through the worst, most difficult situation? Worship. Worship before the breakthrough. And then learn to love perfectly. This is a, comes by Revelation. I can teach it to you and God's word teach it to you, but you have got to learn what it means to love perfectly. That means that you are out giving, out doing, out caring. You have no selfish ambition in you and you're always going the extra mile and making the sacrifice. And they say, hey, can you go a mile? You go to, can you give me your jacket? Yeah, now don't strip down, but you can have all my clothes. <laughs> go home and change and pack them a nice bag. It's a spiritual understanding that you're always going further to outgive, outdo, outlove. It costs no matter what, and it's not about the return. But you learn this, and you know how you learn it? By how he treats you. And then finally, it means you fight to rescue and save others. All of this brings death, continued death to the enemy, and notice that Jesus is sitting down in heaven why? Until his enemies are made his footstool. So let's stack them up. Let's say that. Let's stack them up. Stack and you know how I'm going to stack up some demons? I'm not going to go on a demon hunting hunt, put on my spiritual camo. No. I'm going to be a light on a hill. I'm going to let Christ shine bright, and we're going to set captives free. Be bold. You are Christians. You're sons of the living God. You're not lukewarm, half-hearted believers, and if you are, repent. And I'm not t teaching you anything I don't own. Let's all stand. By the way, before we do this altar call, today is, yesterday was our 11th year birthday. Let's wish Rock City a happy birthday. Now, if you all have time on your way out, there's a photo wall with balloons that to celebrate our 11th year birth, uh, anniversary, birthday, since we started. And uh, Rock City has spoken to me of what they would like for their birthday this year. They would like y'all to give more so we can build the sanctuary. How's that out? <laughs> you know, just make the contribution here so we could get this sanctuary done. We are believing that in the 11th year, yes. this sanctuary will finish, all right? Now listen, let me ask you some questions. Oh, there's cake too? Oh man, okay, whoa. So there's cake out there as well. Get it before your kids do. Let me ask a question. Is anybody here battling major anguish, depression, crazy thoughts in the head? The devil has been in your head nonstop and you need to make the trade. If that's you, you can say to the Lord, Lord, I need to make this trade. Your heel's constantly been struck so much, you're walking crooked, you're angry, you're mad, you're ticked off all the time, it's everybody else's fault. 
you're bitter, your, your heart has become calcified and you need a soft, pliable heart. You lost the person you once were. You used to be kind and gentle and sweet, but through hardship of life, you became, life became bitter and hard. If that's you, then we're gonna pray for you. Are you tired of being crushed and ready to do some crushing? How about this? You know you've had a crooked heart and you need to repent. Do you know I did nine weeks of repenting of a crooked heart in this church? Stuff I didn't even know was there. You gotta ask the Lord to show this to you. And next, you need a heart transplant. So just close your eyes for a moment. Put your hands out in front of you in a receiving position or raise them up high. Either one. Listen, this is about you right now. This is about me. As God looks at us, I see his scope and the crosshairs of his scope on the target of your heart. He's taken aim. I'm sorry, Lord. One of the best things you could say is I'm sorry. Trade my heart of stone, every callous place. I've been so calloused, Lord. Come on, say it. If that's you, say it. You've been mad, bitter, angry, you got hurt. I'm sorry, Lord. Instead of trampling snakes, I've been the snake. I don't want to be that way anymore, Father. You can tell him in your head, you can talk to him in your spirit, or you can say it out of your mouth. Please, Lord, rescue me. Pull me out of darkness today, God, so I can pull others out. It's been all about me and my stuff and my friends and my flesh. It's not who you are your sons and daughters of the living God. You have power and authority. The God of peace will crush Satan's head. I speak peace to you. And the life that's in you, son, you have the life of Christ in you. The devil is defeated and it's through peace and rest you will crush his head. Give me peace, Lord. Some of you need to say this stuff. I'm just, I'm just following the Spirit. If I say something you need to say, say it. Lord, I ask for peace and rest. I've been angry. I've been mad. I've been discouraged, and fr- whatever it is. Just, Lord, I need your peace, God. And it's through your peace that I know the enemy will be fully crushed under my feet. And I'm sorry, Lord, for constantly allowing my heel to get snake bit and not run into you. I'm shutting the door to the lies of sin I'm shutting the door to my flesh, the drugs, the alcohol, the porn. Any of it, all of it has got to go. Get out, of my, get out of our life. Get out of this house. Rock City Church is a purified bride. I'm going to prophesy this over you. You are a foundation of gold. And every wood, hay, and stubble thing in our lives, he's going to burn out. He's not going to leave us the same. Don't run, don't quit, don't stop coming, and don't stop running to him. You are a purified foundation. You are a gemstone in the kingdom. You're diamonds and emeralds and rubies. You're full of wisdom. This church is full of life and power. You will not be divided. Lay down the division and get united. We are in it to win it because Christ already won it through the cross and the blood. Devil, the blood of Jesus is against you and I command you to step out of this house and step off this church and step off your bride and step off this city. And Lord, I thank you that we are united as one. I declare that your home will be a sanctuary. Stop making your house a den of thieves. And if that means getting rid of the alcohol, get rid of it. If that means getting rid of anything that you know is in there that's not right, get it out. You cannot go into 2024 the same. None of us can. I can't either. And I make a prophetic declaration that you are gonna be everything God's called you to be, period. 
you're a son, you're a daughter. He loves you. You're in his hands now. Not my hands and not your hands. You're in his hands. Be at peace this season. He is the Christmas seed, a promise of a birth of a son that birthed many, many, many sons all over the world for thousands of generations and will continue to do so until he comes back. Be at rest and be at peace. Walk in your identity and make the exchange and be new every day. I bless you and I strengthen your life. Be nourished in the spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.